it's time for talk. Each evening at this time, Monday through Friday, Rosemary interviews local personalities and others who bring items of interest to this community. Time for Talk is a community betterment service designed to cooperate with our local community betterment program. Tonight, Rosemary takes us by means of portable camera out of our studios and maybe into your neighborhood. And now, it's time for talk. Tonight, I'm rather like the mosquito in the nudist colony. I just don't know where to begin. I've been dipping back into the good old days, and you might put a question mark after good old days. We're going to talk about when Dunklin County was first settled. What were we like? We were wet, let me tell you. We were swamp east Missouri. Dunklin and Stoddard counties were settled last, and when you take, if you could have taken an aerial view in 1845 of Dunklin County, you would have seen something like the map I have here. You would have seen a long, narrow uh, county. It's 50 miles long and about five miles wide in some points. And you actually can see from this map exactly why we were laid out like we are. Um, we are bordered on the west by the St. Francis swamps and sloughs of the St. Francis. And on the east, we are bordered by um, what you see here is Lake Nibormi or Lake Nikormi. It all depends on what vintage map you have. Then you have the Great East Swamp, uh, the entire length of the county, or you have Little River Swamp or New River Swamp or uh, East Swamp, uh, depending on the map you check. And in fact, the boundary line description of Dunklin County says to the middle of the main channel of the St. Francis River. And if you don't think that made for problems, this map is a fairly accurate map, except they do not have enough of the sloughs drawn in in the southern part of Duncan County. The land did have sand ridges that were raised, and perhaps a better map would, um, we'll look at a better map to show us how the land was, as the early settlers put it, St. Francis was no river at all. It was 30 miles wide and 3 feet deep, and in 1819, a report described the land as covered by clear water flowing southward. If you remember, a tight Miss Josie Langdon says that very thing. She lived on the banks of Little River at Hornersville, and the stream was a beautiful blue color. If you can imagine Little River looking beautiful and blue, but there was a time. Had an interesting guest this summer, a Dr. Robert Dunnell, who uh, is head of the anthropology department in Seattle, Washington. He, uh, we were in a cotton patch on one of those hot July days. He dropped down, squatted down there, and with his finger drew me a map in the sand, and he talked about the ice age and what it meant to Missouri. He said as far uh, south as the Missouri River, there were glaciers that were three miles thick. Three miles thick that came down that far. He said the Mississippi River flowed down the west side of Crowley's Ridge. The Ohio River was probably where the Mississippi is at this point. And when the glaciers began to melt, sometime in that intervening period, and he sent me a whole booklet. When the glaciers began to melt, the Mississippi River captured, and those are his words, the Ohio, and it just completely changed course and took over. Now, he sent me a sheet um, uh, that I looked at, and if I could understand it, uh, I could give you a better account. He called it environmental constraints of, of human settlement in an evolving Holocene alluvial system, the lower Mississippi Valley. And there are pages and pages of this report, uh, studies that have been done to talk about the channels of the Mississippi and to talk about what's been done in this area. Evidently, we were maybe the mouth of the um, Gulf at one point, but all of that uh, water flowed and the, the, the mud settled, and, and here we are in southeast Missouri. We were the low point. This is where the water came, and this is where the water stayed. I remember as a youngster in the 30s, even in the cotton patches, picking up yonky pins, which had been deposited there by the lily pads, the very lily pads that you uh, 
uh, saw perhaps in the first of the pictures, they had lain on top of the sand for, uh, well, I don't know how many years, uh, never having sprouted because they need to be covered with water for long periods of time. But those yonka pens covered what now are our cotton fields. The whole of Bo the boot hill was referred to as the sunk lands. And uh, talk about the good old days, we were uh, uh, we shut off, virtually isolated from every form of transportation. Railroads were still many uh, years into the future. It was still possible, even as late in the, as the 1880s and 1890s, for uh, steamboats that came up the Mississippi. They perhaps started uh, at Vicksburg, Mississippi. They could come up the Mississippi to Helena. They could switch over into the St. Francis at Helena and come up into this area, uh, hit the right-hand chute of Little River, and come up into the Hornersville area of the right-hand chute of Little River. Now, Hornersville was laid out as a site because of its uh, place there on the banks of Little River. But you could go all the way up Little River, and you could cross into the uh, Weaverville, Bokerton area, which is uh, there now, and go to Bicoker Landing and go points north. It was possible for keel boats to go across at Point Pleasant or Portageville area and get back into the Mississippi. But the steamboats still had regular passage enough that in 1890, the uh, Kennett Clipper, which is a forerunner of the Daily Dunklin Democrat, the Kennett Clipper printed the steamboat schedule that came into this section of the country. Uh, we were wet, there's no doubt about it. And in our attempt to find out how wet we were and how we got dry from that point, we uh, took our tracing paper and we went to the Duncan County Courthouse. At that point, we knew of the existence of no maps and uh, weren't able to find either. We, we went to the courthouse and Dixie Ross was a great help to uh, show us some of these things. Let's show you a bit of footage from there. You see us uh, tracing the sloughs with paper and uh, this was a long, tedious process to do the whole county because it was broken up in townships at that area. Uh, you see um, Varney River and the Ragaline Slough and uh, all of the areas around. Here's what we came up with. Just a bit uh, on this map will show you our tracing and, and we have the St. Francis River here and the swamp called Seneca Creek. Now remember, this is 1843 of the original survey and the swamp called the Kennemore Slough. You see also Gumshoe Island and uh, of course you're down in the Cardwell area to get these two things. We since that time found a later map. Uh, it's the Camel's Gazetteer uh, map and it was a uh, topographical map. It was printed in 1872 and they had done much of the work for us. You see here uh, Duncan County, you're able to see this long narrow county and the five miles wide here. You see the Little River Swamp. You see all of the sloughs, uh, Kennemore Slough, Buffalo Slough. You see uh, the swamp called Little River, of, of course, all written in. And you see that there are a series of crisscrossing islands there. The sand ridges stood out, but they were only two or three feet above the rest of the land. Uh, most of the year, uh, in the summertime at least, they were dry. But in the rest of the season, the swamps and sloughs crisscrossed, and uh, as we said, this was just one big happy swamp most of the year. Now tonight, we want to talk about how we emerged from that swampy area to what we have now. On a 1930 map we have, you will be able to see that even the names of these little islands that the sloughs made are still named and the, the early histories speak of a man being born on Horse Island. Well, you have to look at an early map to know that Horse Island was Zenith. Uh, let me show you the map. This is a 1930s map called a quad map and uh, let me orient you now. We are, here's the St. Francis River all up and down to this area and this is the floodway uh, ditch and here's Hornersville. All right, you're in the Cardwell, uh, Arbord, Hornersville area down here and next to the St. Francis you see readily the islands that were here uh, so designated on this big map in 1930. Here's Seneca Island, which is formed by Seneca Slough. 
and coming on uh, northward a little bit, you're able to see uh, 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 Indian Hill Island and Wilkins Island and uh, Bone Camp Island and Gum Island, and you expect this all in the area of the uh, river. Cypress Point Island, but what is difficult to realize that even as you move farther out into what looks dry here, you are seeing islands all uh, through here. Zenith, we said on Horse Island, and if you take a, a, a longer look, Horse Island runs all the way. Horse Island is a big island, and here are your words right here that say uh, Horse Island to let you know. And of course, this was Buffalo Island here. And up in the Zenith area, uh, separated slightly is is a is a polecat island. Uh, I don't know the boundaries between Zenith and uh, between Horse Island and Polecat Island, but evidently they were formed by the uh, Honey Cypress Slough, I would say, or the uh, Buffalo Ditch, as we know it. Somehow those cut off the islands. Now, there was a very interesting thing that was unusual in this county, if I can get my bifocals to it. South well, in the area of Carruth and South, you see right here, so designated, an area called Grand Prairie. That was, as we said, a more extensive sand ridge. Some uh, histories call it a dome, a sand ridge dome. It was two or three miles wide and 10 to 12 miles long, known as Grand Prairie. It had no trees. It had prairie grasses on it. How it was formed and when and why, we only have to guess. Some people surmise the earthquake in 1811, 1812. Others say it was here much longer than that and was a natural rise. But the whole area was a series of islands crisscrossed by sloughs that adjoined all the honey cypress and the Kennemore and the Seneca and, and the St. Francis and the uh, Little River drainage areas. As we said, it was all wet. And yet, there were many settlers who came into this area from Kentucky and West Tennessee, and I've heard my father-in-law, Mr. Bircham, talk about coming here in 1898 to this section of the country. He came across uh, either at the Carothersville, which was called Little Prairie, or at Cottonwood Point. To both of those were great ferry points. And actually, this map does not show all of the water that uh, really was here. But he would come across, and in, in his words, they would hire a wagon, to, uh, and they had to hire a guide, a flatbed wagon with a guide who really knew where the uh, sand ridges were. And he said, you soon got uh, in water up to the wagon bed, and the, only the guide knew where those sand ridges were, and uh, you and the wagon didn't see any firm ground for miles as you came across here no firm ground, he had to pick his way, you had come on a mule-powered ferry. Now you think how different that is to the, today when we get uh, in our nice cars and we can sail across that great bridge at Carothersville. Uh, it was hazardous to get here and uh, you had to really want to go somewhere. And when you got here, there was not much out of the water. Tonight, we've been trying to understand the draining of southeast Missouri and what, uh, what our what, at what price we have had to pay to get uh, our land out of the water. I thought to, to be able to get more into the story, we're going to have to continue this at a later time. Uh, some of the sparse population had thoughts and visions of what this agricultural land could be if we could ever get it high and dry. And the only thing that you can say to justify their rosy thoughts was sublime ignorance of what it would take to get it done. We'll talk uh, possibly tomorrow night or at some night next week about the early attempts and how it was finally done. I've been watching Time for Talk. Time for Talk is a community betterment service designed to cooperate with our local community betterment program. Each evening, Monday through Friday at this time, Rosemary interviews local personalities and others who bring items of interest to this community. If you are aware of items of interest, please let us know for possible airing on this program. Time for Talk is brought to you through the cooperation of Kennett Cable Vision Incorporated and is produced through the facilities of the Slicer Street Church.